Hey everyone, welcome to Ortho Thrive. We have a special guest today, Dr. Anthony Bonavoglia. Um, Dr. B has always had an affinity for efficiency and systems. In 2007, he bootstrapped his startup practice in the Hudson Valley, New York on a shoestring budget through strategic system implementation. Also as a solo practitioner, he manages a team of over 20 employees and starts over 800 patients a year. In 2019, he launched Startaloo, an orthodontic company focused on enhanced payment presentation, pending payment follow-up, and data analytics. As a fun fact, in 2009, Dr. B held the world record for largest oral hygiene lesson. I'll have to hear more about that. In his spare time, he is an avid ultimate Frisbee player and enjoys skiing with his family. He earned his dental degree from SUNY at Buffalo and his master's degree and certificate in orthodontics from the University of Minnesota. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Richie. Yeah. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, about Startaloo, what it does, how it can help. Yeah. Um, so I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in Long Island, New York. Uh, I'm an Italian from New York. So if you see my hands get in the picture, you'll understand why. <laughs> yeah, I have the same problem. I have to <laughs> hold on to them sometimes. Um, yeah, uh, I went to dental school in Buffalo, as you mentioned, and then did my residency at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. I was an associate for a little while and then started my practice um, in Hudson Valley, as you mentioned, 2007. A little bit of an unconventional startup. Uh, I did start my practice. It was, it was a bootstrap practice. I had about $30,000 in the bank and did it without a, a startup loan. So that's, wow. that's a whole nother story that we could, we could talk yeah. about. Um, but yeah, so I've been practicing here. So it was about 13 years. Mm. And, um, and then as you mentioned last year, we launched a software, uh, company Startaloo, which, you know, some of your listeners I'm sure are familiar with. Yeah. Cool. Well, we wanted to talk about converting pending patients to starts, and I know you have a lot of experience with that. So let's start just talking about ways to reduce observation patient drop-off, some recommendations you have for that, doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why we, we started Startaloo, just taking that step back, is because if we saw a big deficiency in our own practice or my practice, mm -hmm. uh, which was following up with pending patients. And, you know, when you run a busy practice, you know, there's certain things that fall through the cracks and, and talking to hundreds of practices, I think this is a fairly universal problem where we just don't have the resources, the time and the personnel to be able to manage the patient load that we're seeing as far as new patients go. And, you know, all those new patients are going to turn into starts, they're going to turn into observation patients, or they're going to turn into potential starts. Yeah. And so there's sort of a level of follow-up that's needed for all of them. And it was a real, real struggle for us. And, you know, when we were, when I was putting the software together, um, we were trying to think through like, what, what are the ways that we can become more efficient and improve systems on doing the follow-up? So, you know, to go to your question about observation patients, that's one bucket of patients that we need to have some level of follow-up to make sure that we're keeping them engaged with the practice and then making sure we can convert them later on into start. Yeah. So, you know, what we do in our office, I, we, I really don't like patients going more than three months without getting some sort of personal message, um, you know, which is. Yeah. As a marketing guy, that sounds like forever to me. I know. Right. Oh, and and you're right. Like, I have people like that who haven't heard from me. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, you know, there, there's sort of, there's different messages that we can send. We can do social media messaging, which is a little bit more universal, mm -hmm. um, you know, but then there's also your personal messages. So, you know, when it comes to observation patients, we want to try to get them engaged uh, in, in their practice. And there's a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of great consultants that can help with setting up an observation um, protocol that's going to make sure that these patients feel engaged throughout their, their waiting period while they're waiting to start. Um, in our office, you know, one of the important things is just to make sure you have a system down that you can do those items and send those items and make that follow up and that connection with the patient on a routine basis so that they don't fall through the cracks. Yeah, so you have to have some sort of CRM, something to let you know that you need to follow up when you need to follow up the last step. Exactly. I think a lot of 
practices from what I've talked to is they'll, they'll do the batch approach where we'll run a report from the practice management system and we'll batch it. For us, we found that to be fairly inefficient. Uh, again, it's one of those things that gets pushed off and these are a source of production going forward, these patients. So it's really important that we pray, place a high priority. So in our, in our system, we actually have our virtual assistant do the reach out um, within, usually within three months after we've seen them, if I'm going to see them in six months. Uh, so that we get at least a touch point and just make sure that 100% of those observation patients are, are. Yeah, so they're saying, so that's three months from that particular patient last time they're in. So it's not a whole batch of patients. So some are three months, some are actually five months, you know, et cetera. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah as you know, in marketing, timing is just so important. And, you know, it, it needs to, we need to make sure in our practices that we have systems down that we're not going to miss the appropriate time. Yeah, absolutely. So pending patient follow-ups, I was reading your blog and you said, according to some of your data, approximately 20, 29% of patients across all practices will have a same-day start, but then that's 70% of patients that are not having a same-day start. So in general, um, what are some ways to help change that stat a little bit? 70% is a lot. Yeah, you know, there's, when, when we look at uh, uh, exams, we have the same-day start, we have what we call the same day schedule, right? So that, that appointment they schedule, and then you have sort of the free floating patient out there. We don't really know what they're going to do just yet. And you want to have a strategic uh, plan in place for all three of those. Obviously, if you can get more same day starts, you know, that's going to, I think, not only help your conversion rates overall, but it's also going to help because you'll have less work that you're going to have to do to manage those patients. So I think there's a lot of great incentives that you can do to get more same day starts. You can do uh, different discounts. I think having treatment plans in place that you can do a same day start is important. Mm -hmm. Our practice, we moved into indirect bonding. Uh, for us, that was a great way of boosting our same day start because we're saying to them, look, you know, we're not, we our my practice is too busy that I can't put the braces on the same day. We don't have that flexibility in our schedule, yeah. but I can yeah. scan them and say, I'm going to order your braces and you know, now we've initiated a contract and we're actually getting the start. Perfect. So, um, so that's one way if, if you're using like a motion appliance, again, we're going to order your motion appliance. That's the way we phrase it so that they understand there's a bit of investment on their part that we're ordering something. So you're taking some sort of step forward to get a contract. Yeah, that makes Correct. sense. But yeah, we, we don't do the same day start discounts. I, I do think there's a place for it. Um, I think my, my only concern is that I see a lot of practices and we see that with our software that a lot of practices will put that into place, but then don't, don't actually track the metrics on that. Yes. And is it actually paying off for you? Is it, is it, are you really getting what you are putting in? I mean, you're, you're paying for something, you're, you're reducing your fee. You want to make sure you're getting back what you're paying into. And I just think it's important if you're going to do something like that, that you track how much production loss and are you getting the conversion, the increased conversion in those same day starts to go along with it. So would you say the focus is on increasing the percentage of same day starts and more on following up with that 70% that wasn't the same day start just to make sure they do eventually become a start? Yeah, I think, I think it's a two prong approach. You want to make sure you have good systems in place to, to get the same day start. Cause I do think that's an important part of being, um, you know, to being a, a, a viable practice. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that can go from how you're positioning that new patient exam, how you're phrasing what the actual start is and um, getting the patient to commit. There's some treatment coordinator. Um, there's a lot of great, again, consultants that can talk to treatment coordinators on how to, phrase it so that they can get patients to start that day. And then having another um, system in place to help with the patients that aren't going through and making sure you're doing your follow-up. And, you know, again, going back to, we talked about the timing on the follow-up is just so critical and all the data is showing that, oh, absolutely. that if, if you're not timing it properly, you <laughs> are losing out on conversion rate. That makes sense. You talked about also um, putting some content in your follow-ups. I was reading in your blog, what kind of content are you putting in your follow-ups that is helping with that conversion? Yeah. So I think, you know, when we come to a follow-up, one of the things that even before we even get to talking about contact, as far as the timing goes, yeah. you know, you and I were talking about this earlier about, you know, when do you make that first point of contact? And a lot of practices are batching 
again, their, their initial follow-up after the patient leave the practice and doesn't start. And that's just, you, you're really not, that's really not a great strategic plan for meeting patients where they need to be met. So, you know, if I batch my, my follow-ups and let's say I did them yesterday and I'm only doing them once, once a month or twice a month and I see a patient today, it could be two weeks, it could be four weeks before I reach out to them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I love the analogy of if I went on a first date with someone and I waited two weeks to call them back, you know, what does that say about how, my, how I really felt about them, right? I mean, that's not really showing knowing those patients that you really care, or at least it wouldn't show that date. I mean, maybe it would maybe they didn't be that I didn't call back. I don't know. But um, so much of digital marketing is, or any marketing in general that you're doing to potential patients, it's really just about relationship building. And we keep saying that over and over again. We have a lot of fancy tools now, but really all we're really trying to do is build a relationship with someone. So I totally agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, and it's so important. So I really am a strong believer of 24, no longer than 48 hours after that new patient leaves, you should be either, I believe calling or texting. I mean, you can do email if you'd like. Uh, a lot of email, people don't read. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's somewhat impersonal. Now, that's, that can be used to your advantage. Um, you know, email is, is a good way of doing a prolonged re-engagement campaign absolutely uh, whereas call and text is more personal but also can be more intrusive so i i'm a big fan of if you're either in 24 to 48 hours let's do some sort of personal phone call or text message and then if you haven't gotten a reply a couple of days later sending another now at that point a text message referring to the initial saying you know uh some to the effects of, you know, did you, I'm not sure if you got my message, but blah, 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 blah. Absolutely. so you're, you're referencing the fact that, you know, you're recognizing the fact that you did try to contact them. They're going to see that and recognize that, you know, Oh, I need to address this. And with that approach, you're going to get about 80 to 90% uh, reply rate on that second point of contact. So you're not going to have to do a prolonged. Um, yeah. 80 to 90% is a great stat. Yeah, you're, it, it, it works really, really well. Now, if you have to go beyond two or three, now you want to start dripping in emails because emails are less intrusive and patients aren't going to get annoyed. And most people don't get annoyed. I mean, they expect to be followed up on. I mean, it's, it's the world we live in. I mean, if I, you know, if I Google Home Depot, I'm stuck with Home Depot ads on my phone for the next. <laughs> the next oh, yeah, that remarketing months. is kicking right in. They have plenty of budget for that. Room. Yeah, <laughs> so... You know, people are kind of used to that. And I think we we have these hangups that we feel like we're being intrusive. You know, a lot of practices that we'll talk to, they'll say, well, I don't, I don't want to badger the patient. You're not badgering the patient. I mean, they came to your office, they met you, they want to get to know you. That's, that's what you have to sell when they come into that new patient exam. And, you know, most of the time, think about how many times you get a text message from a friend and you go, oh, yeah, I got a reply, but you're at your son's soccer game. Absolutely. I'll it's not that. that you didn't care about them. You just were busy and our patients are busy. So, you know, you're not badgering them by following up. I think if anything, it just shows if you do it properly, it's showing that care enough that you want to make sure that you can provide the care that they're looking for. Absolutely. You have to do it properly. The message has to be right. It can't feel too pushy or salesy. Um, it's mm-hmm. professional. You know, as long as you're building a relationship in a normal, natural way, I think it's totally fine. Right. Oh. So is there any other kind of content you're putting in? Are you putting videos in emails and texts, et cetera, when you're following up with pending patients? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll occasionally, if, if it's getting drawn out, we'll start to go more towards an informational campaign. So in the beginning, I want it to be more personal. And, and a lot of the videos, uh, I just personally don't have a lot of time to send individual videos. I think if you have that time, it's great. Absolutely. Uh, you know, oh, you mean personalized videos? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, initially for that first week or so, a uh, week or two, I really want to try to just be on a more personal level. And so for, for our office anyway, having a, you know, a generic video wouldn't work. Um, but I, as you're starting to branch out, now you haven't gotten a reply, right? You know, and if someone tells you, look, I'm just not interested, your next reply should be, you know, we understand, can you explain why? Right? Mm-hmm. And then in Startly, we keep track of those metrics, something we just added recently which is a pull down to be able to keep track of why people aren't 
starting so that you can start getting the data as to why patients yes, are. Yes, and that data <laughs> is so great over the long term, too. You look at a year of why did they not start, and that's when you're making real big strategic decisions about your practice and what you can do to change. Right. And each why, there's only so many whys, right? There's only so many reasons why people are going to tell you why they're not going to start. And you should have a script for each one of those whys. And our, our virtual assistants, when they're doing uh, follow-up on behalf of practices, we have that scripting and we'll follow that script. Um, and if you've gotten to the point where they're just like, no, this just isn't for me. Okay, great. You know, and it's somewhat, we don't do this. You could say, do you mind if we continue to send you just some information? Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like when you've, dropped off of the service and someone will say that's great do you mind if we keep sending information um most patients at that point aren't going to reply yes or no and you can decide if you want to send it or not. uh we usually at that point if they've said no we, you know we're, we're kind of done we don't we don't continue to send them content i gotcha you just <laughs> take them off the list and even just having control to know how to do that easily because sometimes they've said no and they're still going to be pushing stuff to them and people don't like that you have to have control of your data Right, <laughs> right, for sure. And and again, what you're referring to is just, you just need to have a good system in place. So this isn't something you have to think about every time a patient comes in. I mean, this should be one system in place. You drive a patient from start to finish through the pipeline and you go, okay, where can this patient go? And you've got everything in place to, to handle that situation. And that's actually how this, you know, how this whole Startaloo virtual assistant thing came about is it was yeah. hard for us to put that system together and now it's sort of prepackaged for everybody. So when is it a good idea to use automated follow-up, emails, automated text, et cetera, and the other actual phone calls from the virtual assistant or your staff? When would you recommend using one or the other? Yeah, I think if, if you're going to batch your follow-up and if you're going to batch your follow-up and you don't feel that you can do a personal level follow-up on a timely basis, mm -hmm. then automate it. So at least you're getting something within those first couple of days. Yeah. Right. It's, it's better than nothing. It's better than waiting. There's, there's no doubt about it. Absolutely. Um, I, I think you can go more toward my, my preferred method is a more personal approach within those first two weeks. Because again, you, what, what are we aiming for, right? What's the goal? I mean, the goal is obviously to get them to convert, but really the goal is to get them to engage with you, right? I mean, the, the, the goal of your first, your initial goal of the follow-up is to get them to engage in you in a conversation so that you can figure out why they didn't start or why they haven't signed up, and then what can you do to overcome that obstacle? Absolutely. And that's really the goal. And, you I know, so, so many of us will guess at what that obstacle was, which is so scary because then you're making changes based on what you think is going on versus what is actually going on right that can make huge negative have the huge negative consequences right and that's um and that's such a critical that's a great point because this is a critical point in um in making changes in your process and being able to make improvements in your conversion rates it's figuring out why you know like you need to know why patients aren't starting so that you can overcome those those barriers yeah because it could be one of the things that you fix and all of a sudden your whole business changes because this has been happening for years and you didn't realize that these people were not choosing you for whatever reason it right was, it's very simple to fix yeah and a lot of times it's, it's funny because when you start getting comfortable with asking people why and you get you get comfortable with that language and it's oftentimes not what you think yeah you know a lot we i think as orthodox we're we're people pleasers I've had this conversation with a lot of my friends. Yeah, like we're, we're people pleasers. Like we inherently want to make people happy, right? Mm, and so when you ask somebody why, it's uncomfortable because you may hear why you didn't, right? And that's just something we're not wired that way. I mean, I talk to people who are in the, you know, in the sales world and they're totally comfortable with rejection. And it's like, that's not me. That's not us. But you have to get used to that for sure. You, you do. <laughs> <laughs> You do. And once you do, you realize that it's for the benefit of everybody. You know, it's, it's really, it's good for patients to be able to verbalize why they didn't start. Uh, it's good for you to hear it so that you can make changes to your systems. It may be something that you never even thought, you know? And so, um, you know, I think that's another reason why we oftentimes don't do the follow-up so often because maybes are safer than no's you know, psychologically, but maybe uh, 
maybes eat up your resources. You're going to spend more time chasing down maybes. maybes. I, I very clearly want a yes or a no. I, I don't want a maybe and get strung out because then I've got to do more follow-up and, and continue to, to work on converting those patients. Yeah, when we have our clients, um, the teams are working in their CRM, and we're telling the doctors, we have different statuses, of course. And I said, if this status doesn't say patient or not interested, and it's in between, your team needs to be following up with these people. We can't let them hover with, I left a voicemail and nothing ever happened after that. Mm -hmm. We have to follow up until we, they're either a patient or they're not interested. There's yeah. the only two ends of the road. And um, That's right. And if you do it right and you plan it out, um, you're not badgering them. And I do have, you know, I can, I can throw this out. If you'd like, I can offer this on your, um, you know, on your Facebook page. We have a, a pending tree yeah. that, that we've kind of branched out that um, I think does a really good job of engaging without badgering. And again, it's, it's that, that interplay between phone call, text message, and email. Remember, email, you, we get emails all the time, three, four, five times a month from some companies. And you know, I mean, sometimes you feel like they're badgering you, but for the most part, you just kind of dismiss it. So yeah, sure. you can, if you, if you put it in properly, you'll be able to get that yes or no without making that patient feel like you're harassing them. Oh yeah, I think that'd be great. We'd love to share that with the audience, especially if you've seen it working. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's talk about how to leverage a time of day to maximize patient starts. That's a, I thought that was an interesting topic of yours on your blog. Yeah, so, Three of the, we have three main features of our software that we put together. I mean, one is where it all started. In my own practice, I was trying to come up with something to present treatment in a more streamlined way, mm -hmm. a, a program that could automate all my financial policies. And then how can I make improvements incrementally to improve conversion rates and become more profitable? So that's kind of was the goal of the program. I know it's a mouthful, but in essence, I wanted to have more control over my financial process and then be able to pull levers to be able to improve conversion rates and actually see it work. Yeah. So yeah. we started with that, you know, we started, with, I started developing the program about five years ago, four or five years ago, and I was using it in my office and it was working. It was working really well. Uh, then we added the follow-up piece and the other piece of it though is the data analytics. And it was like, okay, we're getting all this data and how can I use this data you know, more so than I can use data in other, in other um, vehicles. You know, we have dashboards. I've got my practice management dashboard. We've got all these uh, great tools. But, you know, sometimes I find that to be a little overwhelming, and I don't really know what to do with it. I agree. But, Having been in some of these practice management systems, they do not make the data easy to understand, to get to, et cetera. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we, we came up with two ideas. The one was, could we design something where you actually could ask questions and get answers? So a little different from a dashboard, which you're going to look for trends. This yeah. is, I want to improve my conversion rate of clear aligners from this zip code. You know, could I, could I get that answer? And then the other thing was, how could we deliver this in a way that was, I could just as an orthodontist, just look at it and boom, I can make a decision right off the, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So we put that together and, and one of the things we had looked at was our time of day statistics and um, what we have is report carding and we call it report card. It's basically a report card. The concept of, um, you know, I have my daughter comes home and she tells me she's got an A. Yeah. Great. But if I look at her report card, she might have 500s and 150 and all right, how do I improve that 50? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that was the concept. So how do we split the information? So we built this report card system. And one of the parts of the report cards is it tells you your time of day, how you're converting. So when we first got this whole all hooked up and I, I would put my, my information on the system, uh, I, I, it was amazing. I looked at it and we found that our conversion rate, I, I do one evening a week. I do uh, 11 to 7. Yeah. And my conversion rate from the six to seven o'clock slot was the lowest by far. Interesting. And I was really surprised. I would That's have thought intuitive. I wouldn't think that hundred <clears throat> percent. I would have thought midday. I'm probably getting a lot of adults, yeah. but it was, it was the end of the day. So it just pulled the team together and I said, all right, you know, we've got this data. What are we going to do with it? So, you know, quickly the treatment coordinators are like, well, you know, that slot, we have a lot of emergency appointments. 
we generally run a little later than usual and we really try to pride ourselves on being on time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the treatment coordinators are like, you know, we're also kind of tired, you know, it's the end of the, of a long day. So we started kind of just playing with it. We just said, all right, let's just, let's clean up the schedule. Let's swap the treatment coordinators. Whoever does the five to six doesn't do the six to seven. Um, and we found that we were able to increase that one hour over a stretch of time that actually we estimate made us about an extra $40,000, uh, over the course of, I think it was like pretty short period of time. Yeah. Um, just by making that one change. And so now what do you do? You do the next hour, right? And then you just keep working. And that's the whole point of it is once you have this data, you know, just taking a real focus group, a little small segment of your data and improve that one segment. Don't try to go for the whole thing. Oh, yeah. You know, when you're looking at data making changes, when I was at Boeing, I did a lot of reporting and data mining for them. During, and you always go for the low hanging fruit first. I mean, that's going to have the biggest, make the biggest difference for you quickly. <clears throat> yeah. The, the report, I actually, um, I could show you if you want to see what it looks like. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Yeah, I could pull this up. Let me, um, so I'll just pull up a, a demo page. So I'm a bit of a data geek, so I don't know. I don't know if everybody will find this is exciting. Well, when we first met, this is how you got me to start talking to you because we were in a, I forget which conference it was, called SAO, I think. And uh, you realized I was into data, so we just started talking about it. So I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, you know, and this has made a huge difference in my practice. You know, I mean, we, so we have the the two parts, you know, it's the data engine which is what we call, uh, we call this screen here. And then there's the report carding. And so if you, anytime you can pull a report card Mm -hmm. and it'll download it. And this is just demo data. So I don't mind showing this and you know, it'll split out your information. Now this may look a little overwhelming at first, but it's super easy. I mean, it's basically just showing you what are your top converting categories and what are your bottom converting categories? So you can just get some quick information. Shows you how much one percentage of your conversion rate would reduce in a, a production change. And then it just starts splitting out your categories. So, you know, I can look at um, different procedures. I can see how they're producing, you know, on our options. I had a, an appliance. I won't say what it is, but I had an appliance that had a very low conversion rate we decided to just bail on it. We changed it and, you know, we watched our conversion rate go up. Um, but as far as the time of day goes, and what's cool about it, you can run this at any time you want. I mean, you can even look at some patient demographic information, just kind of split that out, see where you're resonating, where you're not. But yeah, just the easiest one is just the time of day. And you can just see very quickly, you know, what time of the day are you converting and where aren't you? And that'll help you make some different some changes. Absolutely. But that's a, we do, we met, we monitor um, missed calls a lot for our uh, clients and we've noticed there's certain times a day if it's just, it's simple, but if you're missing a lot of calls, what's going on? Um, you can just fix that. And who knows how much that's going to help your conversion. So, yeah, it, you know, even, even when you start looking at like your referral sources and you can start splitting out your, individual doctors as far as which patients are they referring you and how is the percentages yeah. y- you start to look at things differently you know we we've made a lot of changes um based on this data you know we we used to do geofencing i don't know if you're familiar with how that works where course, you yeah. you know well, actually you are um basically what you do is if you walk into an area right your ad kind of persists with them and you know one of the things we did is we just looked at our insurance and we saw which patients were converting and which ones aren't and the ones that were, we geofenced the employers with that, who offer that insurance. And of oh, course, we 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 write the we had an ad that said, "Hey, mm-hmm. we uh, you know we offer this insurance." So you know the concept of like throwing this huge net out and hoping to get patients to come in. We're going to start focusing what where we throw that net, and now we're getting much higher qualified patients coming in. So we're seeing our conversion rates go up because we're not just throwing this huge net out there. Yeah. When the people are asking, I'm talking about buyer personas, target, you know, who are you targeting? And um, we're talking to our clients and say, the only answer is everyone. The only wrong answer is everyone. You cannot mm-hmm. target everyone. <laughs> like, right. You're not, you know, Microsoft or Google and have an unlimited budget. We need to be very 
very laser focused on who we're trying to get to walk in through the door. And That's right. Campaigns like that are even the next step of that. When you have the data, you can make those sort of decisions with confidence. So that's a great idea. Let's talk about the data because we go, I've been in a lot of these systems um, helping our clients make um, decisions. And I've noticed a lot of the data is pretty dirty data and it's not mm -hmm. easy to use. But I know the way Startaloo works is a little different. How do you ensure the data is coming in clean so that we can feel pretty confident that these decisions we're making are based off of reality and not someone kind of fat for hearing something over and over again, just making errors by the staff or whatever the problem might be? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an awesome question. So, you know, when we were, putting this together we're saying, okay, how, how do we eliminate this idea of, you know, unclean data getting into the system? And, and one of the best ways to make data clean, at least we found, was if it's patient facing, it's going to be done right. Yeah. Right. So since our platform is patient facing, when you're doing the presentation, you're doing it in front of the patient, it forces you to do it accurately. Now I will say, People find ways, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's always a way to cheat. <laughs> but for the most part, yeah. um, you know, if you're following, it's just a very simple workflow when you're doing a presentation. Um, it, your, your information has to be accurate. And so that's why, you know, we, we've had a lot of requests over the last year. Of, hey, can, you know, I love your, your data reporting. There's nothing else like that on the system. I mean, the way you can segment out and and I'm only showing you a tip of the iceberg as far as what you can do with the data. Can you pull the information from my practice management system so that I can, so that I can look at the data through your lens? Mm -hmm. Answer is no, because one, your system isn't capturing this information. Absolutely. You know, most of our systems are capturing the information on our starts, but we're missing out on the non-starts. Um, and that's what we capture just as much of. And then two, uh, there really isn't a way to verify that that practice management system is the information is clean. And so we don't want to kind of muddy the waters by putting information that we aren't confident is going to give you accurate information, uh, spinning accurate information back at you. Gotcha. So a potential patient walks through the door, you, someone who's using Startaloo as a software, it's they, they literally are using a tablet and they're going through and capturing the data with them doing the presentation. Can you kind of walk us through what it's like? Yeah, I could. Do you want me to just? I can pull it up on my. Yeah, whatever my the easiest way is. I just want everyone to under, kind of understand the process and whether they're using Startle or some other um, solution. I think it makes sense to gather the data this way if you can, if it can work with your patient management system. Yeah, let me show you here. So I'll pull up a, a test patient. Somebody asked me, I, I had done one of these recently, they said, are you a Vanderpump, Vanderpump Rules? Is that the name of it? I guess this name is from, from some TV show. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, lost on me. Yeah, so, you know, what we do is, so when the patient comes in, I, I've come into the, off, uh, into the exam room and I've said, you know what, like, Jack's a great candidate for braces or clear aligners, and then I leave. And at this point, our treatment coordinator is doing, this is what we call a presentation, a financial presentation. And she's just going through and she's just selecting, you know, these little um, pop drop downs. And this is where we're starting to capture that data. Now, one of the reasons we like insurance on here too is not just to capture the data, but we can also automate the entire fee schedule for those insurance plans. So your treatment coordinator doesn't have to remember, you know, oh, that's a, you know, you're going to get a discount on that plan or whatever it may be. Oh, wow. Okay. And then with that, you're capturing the data too. And so I'm just going to pull. And again, this is a this is a procedure set. Uh, we totally customize this for our practices. When we onboard um, a client, we send them out a survey, and then you work with our team to create a procedure set that makes this very easy for your treatment coordinators to present. Plus, capture the data that you're going to want to look at later on. So I'll just pull this. Uh, Delta insurance and a full clear liner 18 months. And again, these could say anything, anything you want. And we do also, if let's say I needed an expander. So how do we, you know, how do we ensure that we're getting all the data we want on an expander? Because right. I can tell you in my practice that when I offer an expander with 
full treatment or clear liners, my conversion rate goes way up. Ah. Right? And so we want to be, make sure that we've got that information. So we just put videos in here, you know, that explain how the appliances work. And you can just present this real time with the. That's right. Patient, yeah. And then they also can go home and pull this up as well. So they'll have all their videos and everything all in one portal, the videos, the financial options, and then the ability to sign contracts. Gotcha. Okay. So now all this data is going into Startaloo or the CRM, and it's also going into the patient management system at the same time. So there's no double entry of information. Well, it's, yeah, that's a good question. So we don't currently have uh, integration to go to a practice management system. Yeah. So what you would do is we can pull the patient's names in so you don't have to double enter the names. Uh, we're going to pull status code so that we can keep track of your patients. This is something we're just uh, launching. Actually, yeah. we were in testing over the last couple of weeks. But we're going to be launching it uh, right away. And um, but once you've gotten to the point where, you know, you're doing a presentation with them and, you know, you're going over the different choices and if they select the plan, then you would save this and then you would just enter it into your practice management system. Just like you would if you was using a, an Excel spreadsheet, yeah. you would then transfer that information into your practice management system. And at that point, you don't really need our system other than the data. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, we were also talking about, so when you're work, say you're working with a marketing firm like ourselves, what are the roles, what should doctors watch out for to make sure they're getting the most out of their firm, make sure they're not sabotaging their firm, but also making sure they're getting, the firm is getting, doing as much as they can for the practice, et cetera. What do you, what do you view the relationship like to make sure it's a successful one? Excuse me. Yeah. I've, I've had a, this conversation. It's funny since launching this company and working with different marketing groups, I'm, I'm starting to see both sides, right? I, I have the orthodontist hat. Um, and then I'm starting to see it from the perspective of marketing companies as yourself. And it's funny hearing the frustrations from both sides, <laughs> right? So, you know, being out of one foot in each world and, you know, on the orthodontist side, I hear, well, you know, I don't feel like the marketing company is, is producing the way I want it to produce. I'm not getting the ROI the way I want. Mm -hmm. On the marketing side, I'm hearing, well, I need more information to be able to perform better, right? And so I think to a degree, us as orthodontists, we owe it to ourselves that when we're going to hire a company to do our marketing, we've got to look at this as like a partnership where, you know, we're not just going to you know, here's some money and I expect you to perform, there's going to be a level of work on our end that we have to do if we want to get the most out of it. Yeah. And, and I think that the challenge has been who's going to do it. Right. It just comes down to that. Yeah. We pride ourselves as being as turnkey as physically possible, but there has to be some sort of collaboration going on, of course. Yeah. But who's going to do it is a great question. And um, yeah. sometimes and usually, the doctor's great and they want to do it and they have the time. And other times they're great. They just don't have the time. Right. So give me someone in the office who's responsible and we can communicate with. I think that's very essential. Yeah. I think, I think there needs to be someone who's designated. And that's even why, again, on our software, just, we're just having this conversation, you know, we've, we've created a um, consultant level access to the data so that, you know, companies like yours, you don't have to rely on the practice to provide that data back to you. You can directly tap into it in real time and be able to tell, hey, this is this is a hot area. You know, this is a hot zip code that we need to be marketing heavily. And, you know, this this demographic has kind of gone cold. Let's change our our marketing strategy, um, you know, because kind of what you were saying, if you're marketing to everyone, you're going to get no one. And, you know, I, I think that that you know, my hope is that we can bridge that gap somewhat and be able to bring the two worlds together so that it's not so labor intensive for the practice. Yeah. And it's yeah. Not so reliant on the marketing company on the practice to get that information. Even I would imagine even for a practice management consultant, they'd love to be able to have access to this data. Even if they're not doing marketing, because it's going to help you make these strategic decisions. Yeah. You, our data, you know, is, is helpful from a number of different 
viewpoints. I mean, we can tell you, you know, I, I sit down and I look at my TC performance. I've got five treatment coordinators and, you know, I'll look at them and say, okay, who's really strong with this demographic. And, you know, we've done some switch arounds where we go, okay, I've got one treatment coordinator that's awesome with kids. And I've got one treatment coordinator who's resonates better with adults. Surprisingly, you might not have guessed it um, from the, but the data doesn't lie. I mean, it's, it is what it is. So we just try to match them up. Right. You know, Hey, you're going to be more on the kids. You're going to be more on the adults and, and watch that conversion rate go up. Um, if I've got a treatment coordinator that's struggling with clear aligners, I can pull that data out instantly. That report card that you saw, I can do a whole report card for one treatment coordinator and just, just, just that one treatment coordinator's report card. So, oh, so you, you could use it for a situation too. You could. I mean, and really where it's valuable is being able to help them, right? I mean, if they're, if we're struggling, we're all, we all need help somewhere. Mm-hmm. None of us are perfect in everything. Yeah, and you know, unless we, unless we know where, how do we improve our job? I mean, you know, it's the same for me too. You know, I'm, I'm recommending appliances. I think we're doing fine. It turns out, you know, I'm doing a really bad job of, of explaining the importance of this appliance. It's going to be reflective in the data. So yeah, we use, a tre- we use a report card for our treatment coordinator. We pull that one treatment coordinator up. We run a report card. We see where are her strengths, where are her weaknesses. If we can see there's a strength somewhere and a weakness somewhere on somewhere else, I'll have them work together to train so that we can get them both up. Mm-hmm. And it, it's very, very effective in, in boosting overall um, uh, practice performance. Um, let's talk a little bit about data segmentation in general. I was, we were just talking about buyer personas yesterday and online advertising. And I was explaining to everyone how I like to have campaigns for each buyer persona, preferably on each stage of their buyer's journey. But I bet you have some great ideas of what, what a campaign would be associated with what segment of people, um, to make, so that makes sense. Cause I think a lot of doctors right now have maybe one campaign that's going on going to everyone and it's that next level where we want to have several campaigns that are really targeting a very specific segment of people. What are some segments that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we talked a little bit. One of the things that we've done that was very successful was the insurance campaign. I mean, For that's, sure. you know, that's, that's a very a high level, I'd say. But we, that's yeah, and, and works really well. Um, I, I have found that I... From, from a segment, I'm, I'm trying to think of what has worked really well for us. Uh, I can tell you from my data which practices refer which demographic more so than others and how they convert. And so yeah. we target those practices a little differently, right? These are referring referring offices. Mm-hmm. So we might target them a little differently. If, if I've got a practice that's referring more adults and I'm noticing their adult patients are converting, I might strategically um, talk, have like a, a lunch and learn that's a little bit different from practice that's more focused on kids. That's good advice, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, if my high, so my highest converting zip code on clear aligners is not that close to me. It's it's really kind of odd. I never would have imagined it. Hmm. Um, so we do some heavier marketing there. Um, we've tried to put our finger exactly why that is. Now, I'm not saying it's my largest number of patients coming in. That's okay. I don't, I'm more focused on when it comes to marketing, I want converting patients more so than volume. Um, my practice, I don't want a lot of patients who are coming in that aren't starting. We want to be very targeted in who we get in the door. And this one zip code just converts much higher than the rest. And so we do more targeted clear aligner marketing in that one zip code. Yeah. So you have a solution, you have the geo target down, you can push the campaign to it. Exactly. Makes a lot of sense when you have the data and it really, it really does make a big difference there. Um, oh, you had a great video about virtual consultations in your workflow. We'll point, we'll tell everyone to go see it, but just kind of give us the summary of your workflow when you're doing virtual consultations right now with everything that's going on. Cause we can use zoom right now because the HIPAA rules are a little relaxed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So our, our virtual consults, uh, what we do, we shoot them over a video of how to take photos. Um, we this send them our help. a tutorial of how to take the photos to send you. Okay. Exactly. Um, we have a HIPAA, or, uh, HIPAA and medical history form that they sign. We're using um, Patient Studio. I, I, we just signed up for them and yeah, with them. And, I heard that one. Yeah, been happy with them so far. We just literally just started with them though. Um, and then also a little 
information on how to use the Zoom link. And we get those photos back. If we haven't gotten them back, we want to call usually a day before just to say, hey, don't forget to send us your photos. And mm-hmm. we have them texted to us. You know, there's, you have to be careful with HIPAA policies. Right now, things are a little bit more lax. But, um, you know, I recommend you, you know, figure out from a HIPAA perspective what's going to be um, compliant. And then we put them in our practice management system. And then I pull up a Zoom meeting and I usually have myself, my treatment coordinator, and then the patient. And I thought that was <laughs> the treatment coordinator and you are on the Zoom at the same time. That's, that's yeah, it, I find it to be a little less awkward. You know, it's almost like doing an exam by yourself, which I, I don't never feel comfortable with. It's kind of, uh, okay. you know, and so it's kind of nice to have someone else on the phone uh, on the on the meeting. If they have questions, you know, patients have questions about scheduling, I can drop off. And and the goal is, you know, what what are the goals of it? And, and I've talked about this before. Like, for one, we don't have the wow factor on a virtual consult to impress them with our technology, our, you know, big office or staff running around or whatever it is, whatever it is in your office that yeah, you try yeah. to grab the patient's attention when they come in the door. It's just you. <laughs> and so the zoom meeting is a little less comfortable because you don't have all this behind you. So what are you trying to do? Like to me, I'm trying to make some sort of connection with the patient during this, this zoom meeting. It's a little different than my, my consult in the office. Um, and it's, and honestly, right now, that's not a hard thing to do. I mean, these, these patients are largely at home, are not meeting new people. Yes. Oh, I see. They're a little you know, hungry for some uh, <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, this, they are, you know, people are right now, we're all isolated. Yeah. And so you might be the only new person they're going to meet with the next like three or four <laughs> months. It's a great time to just, you know, talk to them, right? That's Make some advice. Sort of I haven't uh, considered that. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my consults actually go sometimes they go half an hour. I mean, like I'm not talking the whole time, but you know, I'm just saying, you know, how, how are you guys getting through this? You know, I'm, I wish we could be in the office, um, you know, and just try to find something to talk to them about. And then, then I pull their photos up on my uh, practice management system. So I have that running behind zoom and then I share the screen, pull mm-hmm. the photos up, go through everything like I normally would. And if the conversation lends itself to a financial conversation, uh, I will drop off the meeting. And basically for that, I don't shut down the Zoom because I don't want to pick everybody off. I'll just stop sharing my screen, mute everything. Yeah. Let my financial coordinator pull up Starterly right there and she's sharing her screen and they're going over the financials. The goal is not to sell them, right? We're not trying to get them to sign contracts right then and there. I'm We're glad trying to. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> the goal is when they come in, I want them to be ready to start. Mm-hmm. Right. So when I get started in six, eight, 12, however many weeks, I want to have my new patient column filled and I want to have my column filled with these patients who we'll call the virtual console follow up patients. And they're both starting because yeah. I want to be maximally efficient when I get back. I don't want to have to do all new patient exams on these patients. And I, especially if they're not going to start in my office, I don't want them to come in. Absolutely. So you're getting quality patients over quantity. Um, is there anything about Startaloo you want to talk about that we haven't covered? Um, that was a good time for that. Um, I don't know. There's, it's, I, we talked about this this morning. I mean, it's, it's a fairly complex system. Yes, that's um, true. <laughs> it, it is. And it usually takes going through it a few times. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, value in the complexity. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of cool to see practices starting to get it. Um, you know, and, and starting to really use it, and and you can uh, lean on them. If you're working with a marketing company, you can lean on them a little bit for this. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna Full start. Transparency, you guys. We're an affiliate with you guys. We love working with you. I think um, we highly recommend the software. But um, I think that helps a little bit to have a consultant help you, at least with the data part of it and interpreting it and going over it. Yeah, it once for the day to day practice, it's very simple. I mean, you know, you're you're going on, you're presenting treatment. It's just, if you really want to take it to that next level and really try to, you know, really boost your practice, uh, it takes a little bit of, of learning how to use some of the like higher level tools, but that's why partnering with consultants, partnering with marketing groups. So they're doing that on behalf of the practice really helps. Yeah. And I love that stuff. So if you're working with me and I'm just going to give it to you, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying is what we should do. 
Um, I, you guys are having a little bit of a deal going on right now to kind of uh, help everyone out during this crisis. So tell us about that. Yeah, we we were getting a lot of questions about how we do help through the virtual consult um, process during this shutdown. You know, even the last couple of weeks, we we're getting fielding a lot of questions about that. And and really, our segment is the financial piece, right? Being able to do a presentation, financial presentation to them, and then be able to send it home. So patients from home can see the videos of their appliances. They can interact with you through text and email through the, uh -huh. through our, through Startaloo. And then also they can see their financial options. And so people were asking us, you know, how does that become available? But nobody wants to sign up for anything new right now because yeah, of right? You know, <laughs> taking on new, new expenses. So that's where it kind of felt like, all right, I put my orthodontist hat on and say, you know, what's the right thing to do right now? So we just said, you know what, the software, anybody wants it, you can use it for free. Um, you know, we'll just, we'll just throw it out there during the shutdown. You know, we do have virtual assistants that you can actually um, hire or, or, you know, actually use to do your follow-up. Most offices probably don't need that right now um, because, you know, you'll be able to handle that internally during the mm -hmm. shutdown. So that's separate, but the um, as far as the software go, yeah, it goes. If anybody wants right now, now you can sign up. We're not charging onboarding. We're not charging anything until the uh, until the band is left and then lifted and then go from there. Awesome, that's really great of you. Um, we have at least one question. If you guys have any questions, now's a great time to ask them. We have about nine minutes left. Um, and that wanted to know, what do you do to connect at the three month follow up? Um, for six month OBS. Yeah, so I I really like postcards for this. For this, this is where um, I think you get a chance to connect with the child. I mean, most of our ops patients are going to be young, and if you send a letter, the kid's never going to see it. Um, but if you send a postcard, the chances are the kids are going to see. It. So we have um, postcards that I think you can make on Vistaprint. You know, they're very inexpensive. And I just have my treatment coordinator just fill them out. And then on Startle, it prompts them three months, send the postcard to this patient. They go ahead and they zip it right out. Um, and then at six months, you know, the goal is to get them in the office. So uh, that's where we're just starting to initiate a phone call or text campaign just to make sure that they get scheduled. I gotcha. So how does this virtual assistant work? When are they kind of turned on? What are, what are the specific tasks they're doing for the office generally? Yeah. So. So the virtual assistant came about um, over the summer. We had had our software and people were asking us, you know, how do you do pending? How do you do pending? And I was sitting down with my director of operations and I was like, you know, it'd be really cool. You could just outsource your follow-up, right? And not have to do it internally. Um, and, and so we, um, so we're sitting down and we're like, look, let's, we're like, let's try something. Let's take my practice, Dr. B. Smiles. I was like, let's, let's have you do the follow-up on the last, like, two months worth of patients. See what, see what you get, right? Just give it a shot. So went into my practice and I, I, she went to work. I came in the next day and I was like, I figured, you know, maybe she got in touch with a couple patients, whatever. I said, Chris, I had to go yesterday. She goes, I got four people to sign up. I was like, what? She yeah, was right. like, <laughs> four people. And, and less than half a day's work. Four people um, uh, to sign up for treatment. So I was like, that's amazing. And she said, yeah, two, two or three of them said, we had been waiting to hear from your practice, but never heard back. Now, I'm fairly certain that's not true, but I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe they fell through the cracks. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, you never know. So in two days, she had signed up seven patients. Wow, that's awesome. It was, it was crazy. So we were like, okay, we got to do this, right? Because other practices probably having the same problem. So we worked really, really hard in putting the communication tools together so that it was seamless, so that if someone is – if you're using my virtual assistant or you're using a startly virtual assistant, it's as if they're in your practice. The patient never knows they're not in your practice. If she's, they're completely connected to your practice through instant messaging and tech messages, and phone call routing. Um, and it's been huge. We just signed up a practice not too long ago. And in the first day, uh, she converted a patient for them. So it's super cool. And we're seeing practices that use our virtual assistant um, are seeing somewhere between 10 and 14% increase in conversion rates. That's kind of where we're at. I mean, I'll say the number, we're still early uh, mm -hmm. on the numbers. I mean, because we haven't been uh, used offering that service for too long, but it's been really, really cool. Those are good conversion rates. And the fact that you're taking it, taking it off the table for the 
doctor, they don't have their staff. They're giving them bandwidth back. I mean, that's huge. And we know that they're doing a professional job. You're, you're an orthodontist yourself, so you know you right. have to train everyone. But I think that makes a huge difference. My treatment coordinators would kill me if I <laughs> took this service away. Well, and, the, the yeah, beat, I what's, bet. and what's nice about it, too, is it's one less thing they have to worry about. Right? I mean, who wants to sit there and go through all these follow-up phone calls and text messages? And it's deflating. You know, I mean, you know, I totally you, agree because right now, I, you know, I'll get the leads really flowing because we have campaigns and they're working great. And that is the obstacle, you know, um, if, the, if the team isn't used to following up with leads and a lot of teams aren't because they just are not used to this sort of activity, that'll be the bottleneck. And then um, you're talking to your client and you have to explain that it's not a super fun conversation. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, all of a sudden we have to fix the team issue, but well, I mean, most teams are great at it, but no one enjoys doing it. Well, right. some people do. But. Yeah, it's and it it takes uh, it, it eats up time that treatment coordinator could be doing other things, right? Absolutely. You know, instead of making text messages and phone calls, I'd rather them be connecting more with the patients that they need to be connecting with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even simple things like we have a way of keeping track of your patients that have dental needs right i i have a cavity needs to be filled i can't start my clear liners until that cavity is filled we go right into our system you have a very it's a very streamlined way of filling that out yeah. so now mm -hmm. the virtual assistant knows the day they got their cavity done we're calling them hey did you get that cavity filled are you ready to start treatment so just by making sure 100 percent of patients are accounted for and no one falls through the cracks that's how we get to that 10 to 14 percent a lot of it is just making sure nobody is missed. And that's, that's our goal as a company. 100% of patients, no one gets missed. And that's going to make such a difference on the bottom line. I think that's especially important in 2020 since we're kind of forced to have this weird pause in our year. Mm. So we're going to try, you know, if we want 2020 as a whole to be what we really wanted it to be back in January, then we're going to have to make some changes. Right. Um, we had another question. Um, does a TC complete the information in front of the patient or does she bring the patient in at the time of fees? So we do it uh, just like I explained. I, I will sit down. I'll explain what the uh, recommended treatment is. As soon as I leave, they sit around a table. We have a fairly big screen uh, and she pulls up Starlu, does the presentation right in front of them. And with everything preloaded, it takes her two seconds to get to that slider screen. So, and you know, you can also show them add-ons and discounts and optional discounts. You can designate something as optional versus more of a mandatory. So the, the whole process is very, very quick. Um, and it's just very professional looking. You can print out a really nice PDF at the end or text or email them the presentation, you know, so that they can play with it at home. Oh, that's cool. It sounds pretty easy, I'll tell you. Um, is there anything else you want to share? Um, I don't think so. I thank you for having me on. This was yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, everyone, we're going to send out a link that you can schedule a demo. And um, if you use our link, we'll give you a special gift. We'll let you know what it is in a few hours when we send out the reminder email. Um, Dr. B, thanks for coming on with us. I really appreciate it. I think uh, I learned a little bit and I'm sure everyone else did as well. It was uh, very informative. I love using data to make decisions. So anything that helps me do that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again. All right. Sounds good. And take it easy. Be safe out there. All right. Thanks, guys. All right.